I kissed my neighbor's son, and his religious dad did not like it. I've been dying to kiss Nick since, like, forever, and I have this feeling it might happen soon. Nick shifted to this neighborhood ten months ago with his dad and older brother. He was wearing an ugly jumper when I first saw him, but even then, I developed an insanely huge crush on him. He was like a golden retriever whenever he was around kids, and yet, I could see cracks in him. Cracks that were filled with a seemingly incredibly grumpy attitude. My mom told me weeks later it was because Nick had recently lost his mom. It was hard befriending him, but I did not stop pursuing a friendship with him. In the beginning, he rarely talked, but after we got to know each other better, he wouldn't stop speaking. Even though most of the things he said jumped right over my head, I liked seeing him talk. We got closer and closer, and eventually I realized I wanted to kiss him, but I never knew if he wanted the same. Hence, my current crisis. Every time I'm near him, I want to crush him in a bear hug because he's just so darn handsome and sweet. But the very fact that we live in the neighborhood of religious people scares the hell out of me. I'm always scared about the thought, if they find out. Not all of them are scary homophobes, but living between hundreds of deeply religious people, you can never know, right? Nick, well, doesn't really understand the signal, unfortunately. We're going out for grocery shopping in the evening, and I asked him if he wanted to come along. And like always, with that sunshine smile, he answered, Yeah, sounds like a date. With a stupidly whipped smile, I replied, Sure does, haha. <laughs> yeah, me, please. There's something about Nick that everyone needs to understand. I already told you, he's like a golden retriever, but he's very tall. My dad is the tallest in my family, and Nick is taller than him. And we're still 16, so he's only going to get taller. When I walk by his side, it is like walking beside a huge pole. Except this pull is very much human and alive, so he's attractive as hell. We went grocery shopping and the way we were behaving, it looked like we were a couple. He asked me if I wanted some fresh tomatoes and helped me with it, except he was terrible at it. I had to teach him how to collect the best from the pile. At least, he was a good student. Then throughout the shopping, he held the cart. He kept sneaking glances at me as I did my shopping, and honestly, it was hard to keep my blush done. I do not know if he was going to tease me or something else, but I liked this attention on me. It kept me delusional. Lol. After shopping, we went to this little cafe just beside the mart. Because he's taller than me, he sneaked a hand over my shoulder to hold the door open for me, even though I had reached the door first. He told me how not to flutter under that kind of attention. I was melting, but it also made me want to do things for him. He is richer than me, but the way I'm hung up on him, I decided to order for us. When I told him I would order for us both, he grinned and said, Well, I cannot wait to be surprised. Surprises are all that I have for you, I declared confidently. Even though it was obvious, I was nervous as hell. My scarlet blush did not help my case. I did not know what got me so excited about this simple sentence, but I freaked out. Alright? I grabbed our order from the counter, and then stumbled on my way back to him, just because I got distracted by his sunshine smile. The smile eventually dropped as he rushed to help me, going as far as to hold me around the waist to steady me. I didn't know if I was embarrassed about wasting our order or excited about his hand on me because I looked disappointed about the wasted order, but he promised to order it again. He checked if I was alright and then gave the same order. When he returned, I gave him my best sunshine smile too, but he did not stumble. He just said, in a very steady voice, here's your order, sir. At least he sounded cheerful and teasing. And now I'm wondering if I have an ugly smile or if he just doesn't like me enough to lose his senses. Just kidding. Unless, I'm not. Christmas has already ended, but the fever is still high in the air. My parents even bought a gift for Nick. It was a watch, and he seemed to like it very much. Although Nick's dad, Raymond, doesn't like me. He bought me a gift too. It was a small table clock that he explicitly asked me to keep on the bedside table. According to him, this will remind you that time is always running out of hands. Then he laughed his balloony laugh that even Nick cringes over. I'm pretty sure that he meant my school years, but I dared to take it another way. I told myself he was asking to make sure I didn't lose Nick to someone else. Now because I decided to stay delusional, I decided to ask him out for a walk around the seashore. There's another thing about Nick, he loves the sea, so he immediately said yes. After a 5 minute horrifying session of skinny dipping, where I felt like I would drop dead any minute, we bundled up in our softest clothes and walked around the seashore. We talked about school and college. And then I invited him over to my home for the New Year's party. You said your family holds it every year, he asked me, repeating the thing I had said. Yes, and we invite everyone from the neighborhood. It would be nice for you to come. Just me? He teased and raised an eyebrow. 
I laughed and blushed again. I told him that his family was invited. He laughed and then promised to talk to his dad and older brother Jack about it. It was just two days away, so I knew he didn't have to wait a lot. He dropped me off at my house first, even though we lived as neighbors. Before saying bye, he came a little too close to me and then brushed aside a couple of my fringes. I froze. I mean, winter was freezing enough, but his touch completely froze me. For a couple of seconds, I neither heard what he said nor moved. When he laughed, I regained my senses. Embarrassing as hell, I know. I promised to come with my whole family. It sounded a lot like a proposal. Within the next hour, he confirmed his dad and Jack would be there as well. I slept happily after that. See, staying delusional is the only way, Nick's dad. I was helping my mom, May, with the last minute decorations when the first of our guests started arriving. Although I welcomed everyone as enthusiastically as I had always done, I was most curious about Nick. He had not left a single message. I could not see him outside of his home either. The hours started passing and we got closer and closer to midnight, meaning the new year was about to happen and Nick was nowhere near me to celebrate it. When the clock struck 11, I decided to give him a call to check up on him. He did not have to though, because two seconds later, he was ringing our doorbell. His dad and Jack were with him. They gave my parents a gift and Nick immediately started looking for me. I played a little game of hide and seek with him, but when I saw he was growing anxious by the second, I just booed him. He laughed, his sunshine laugh again, and then we started talking. He pointed at the decorative lights and said, They're nice. Thank you, I replied. I bought them. Your taste is always amazing, he complimented me. And I looked up at him and down and thought, Yeah, it is. Nick loved the desserts the most, but when I informed him that I had made him the mini sandwiches and sliders, he would not stop eating them either. He wanted to make me happy, and in my opinion, that is the most boyfriend thing ever. So when my mom called everyone and said, it's time for the countdown, folks, I grabbed his hand without a thought. He looked a little surprised by that, but he did not move away either. Soon, his big hand enclosed my comparatively smaller one. I was so happy then. We counted the seconds together, and it was completely dark, except for the fairy tale lights in the backyard. So, the moment everyone screamed, Happy New Year, I kissed him in his mouth. It was a chaste kiss, nothing scandalous, but I had taken the first step. Thankfully, no one had seen it and my bold step did not start any kind of drama. Nick took a moment to collect himself, but then he did not say or do anything. I started freaking out. I tried to get away from there, but he did not let me move. Two minutes after that, he dragged me out of there and into my bedroom, which he had seen a hundred times by then. He closed the door and asked what that was. I told him the truth. I said, I'm sorry if it was too much, but I did it because I like you. He took a very long minute to see if I was serious, and I was. So it was very obvious. Just when I thought he would hit me for the kiss, he kissed me. And his kiss was much bolder than what I had done. He seemed more experienced and confident than me, but I was glad that we were on the same page. We sneaked a few kisses throughout the night, giggling in between. If anyone thought we looked happier than usual, they did not bother us. A week later, it was Nick's idea to go out for a date. We decided to go to the city's park, even though it is winter. We found many people, partially that could be because of the weather, because everyone assumed us to be very good friends. No one gave us any weird looks, except that one time when someone caught us holding hands and whistled some homophobic comment. We broke apart, but honestly, I wanted to teach him a lesson. It was also there that I found Nick loves children more than I initially thought. While I sat down on the grass because I had zero stamina, he found kids to play with. They played tag and snowball fighting. I was thrilled and in awe about his stamina. It is no wonder he works out every alternate day, even though he is so young. After half an hour, he returned. He was a little sweaty, so I offered him a hanky. The same person who had passed a homophobic comment whistled something again. Nick got up to deal with him, but I stopped him. There was no point in getting violent. The person laughed, made some vulgar signs, and left the place. Nick didn't know him, but I knew him from the neighborhood. Nick pointed to the kids around us and asked what kind of kid we would have. I grinned at him. I don't know. We can adopt kids, you know, he said, and started listing names of the orphanages he had found around the city. He said he had done some research. Wow, I said. He blushed and rubbed his nape. It was nice seeing him like that. You don't want us to have kids? He asked. I do, I answered, but we're way too young to think about that. He agreed on that, but still, entertain me. I laughed and pointed at a little chubby kid. I guess that one. Yeah, right, I was thinking the same. Five minutes later, he grabbed my hand and told me in a desperate tone that he wanted to kiss me. 
It took us 11 minutes to find a good enough secluded space. He cornered me and kissed me. I could do nothing but kiss him back. The next evening, I decided to tell my mom, May, about Nick. I knew she would eventually tell Dad about it, but I was more scared about her. She was more religious out of the two, and I have heard enough scary stories from people dealing with this. Before doing that, I asked Nick if he was okay with it. It took me some nerve to talk with my mom about it. One thing about my mom is that she is a friendly person, so it's easy for her to keep it cool under any circumstance. My dad, Warren, was at his job. My mom was cooking dinner, so as I helped her with her preparation, I casually dropped the news. Nick and you were doing what? She asked if she hadn't heard the first time. Going out, I answered. Going out as friends or... Boyfriends, I informed her. And to make matters clear, I added, We've held hands and kissed, like that and you do. Just like you guys, but not that. You guys haven't slept together? No, Mom. My cheeks were burning in shame. I wasn't sure where she was going with the conversation. Well, she cleared her throat. I'm happy that you told me. So you're not angry? And why would I be? She curiously asked. I pointed at a little Christ figure hung on the wall. She laughed and said that she would always love me unconditionally, no matter what happens. I guess that was her type of answer. I met Nick in the late evening after that. My mom acted a tad bit different than she usually did this time, but she still looked friendly. We met, and when we were at a safe distance, Nick asked me how it went. I told him everything. He was relieved to know that and held my hand in the dark. On our way back, I asked him, what are we? I know that was a typical annoying question, but we had never outright said we were dating. He poked me on the cheek instead of answering. Boyfriends? I asked him. Yeah, boyfriends, he answered. Boyfriends sounds good. I guess that was my type of answer because I couldn't stop smiling throughout the night. Four days later. Nick and I didn't meet for three days after that. It was not common between us. We lived as neighbors after all, so we met frequently, but I knew something was going on long before Nick told me that. When we finally met on the fourth day, on a pretense of going to a beach party, he told me that he was sure something was going on between his dad and Jack. Until now, I hadn't talked to Jack a lot. He looked like a bully, the kind of person who bullies other people, just because they don't work the same way as he does. So I always kept my distance from him. So when Nick looked like he wanted to think about something other than whatever was going on with his family, I suggested we go to the beach party. It wasn't often that something like this was held, and it wasn't exactly a party either, but we decided to go. It was loud, and there were lots and lots of people. On one side, we were glad that there were enough people, and on the other, we were worried that we wouldn't find any privacy in between so many people. After all, wasn't this the kind of time where you'd want to kiss your boyfriend? We were still 16, so we weren't allowed to drink. Even then, Nick sneaked out some from a couple of his friends. The smell and taste were nonsense, but we kept drinking it anyways. As you would expect, we got a little bolder, so when Nick got dared during a truth or dare game with his friends and was asked to kiss his crush, he kissed me. Unfortunately, everyone was drunk enough to not remember it the next morning, but we kissed each other to no end. His friends kept hooting in the background. Eventually, Nick and I felt we needed to take it into a more private setting. He grabbed my hand, and as the loud music played in the background, we found privacy in a secluded area five minutes away from the party. We were drunk, so the decision was a no-brainer. Yes, that means we slept together for the first time. After that night, we didn't meet for another three days. I was growing desperate to be with him especially after that particular night, and it clearly didn't help that he was neither answering my calls nor my messages. So many times I wanted to go over to his home and see if he was doing alright, but his dad wasn't the friendliest of people. I was scared of him. I asked my mom and she promised she would check on him in the evening. Thankfully, Nick called me before the evening. It was during the afternoon, and he said that he wanted to meet urgently. Did something happen? I asked him. Jack's been acting weird as hell lately. I think something's up with him. Should we stop meeting for a while? What if it's because of us? My family knew about us, but Nick's didn't. Nick didn't want to tell him because he knew that they were homophobic. Nick shook his head. I don't want to stay away from you, he answered. And he tried to sneak a kiss from me. I miss kissing you, he admitted. Me too, I answered, but we cannot kiss here. We should go somewhere else. He sighed, so I grabbed him out of there and into my favorite hiding place. Unknown to us, while we were talking, his brother Jack had followed us with all the bad intentions a stupid person could have. We found our corner and kissed. Since it was still afternoon, we didn't go overboard with our kisses, but it was still enough for Jack. He clicked a couple of our pictures and then left the place. 
Fortunately, we didn't spot him then. The same night, while I was preparing for bed, I heard loud arguments coming from Nick's home. I got scared and looked out the window. Although I couldn't see anything, I could hear Nick's voice. I knew something was up, but my parents stopped me. And I, stupid as I was, stopped. I didn't meet Nick for an entire week after that. There were no calls or messages from him, and I was sure that there wouldn't be any. I had spotted Jack with Nick's phone. I stayed out of my home during the late hours of the night just to catch him somehow, but for that entire week, he didn't step out of the home. Then on the ninth day, he knocked on my bedroom window at one in the night. I let him in, and it was then that he had told me about how Jack had sneaked up on us to click our pictures. But he also looked tired, so I let him sleep with me until five in the morning. When I was sure his dad would find out, he left. It's been five days since, and we haven't met again. On the sixth day we met, then he informed me about everything his dad and his brother had planned. He said his dad had asked him to join a conversion therapy, and if he did not do that, then Nick's dad would forcefully out me in public without my permission. Of course, those pictures would help, and to make sure that his dad did not harm me, he agreed to join the therapy. It was the most insane thing I had heard. I told him I was sure that that was banned in our state. He shrugged and asked me, Do you think my dad cares for that? Then to reassure me, he added, Besides, it'll keep you safe, and that's all that I want. Because I was not sure how to convince Nick not to do it, because it was stupid. I let him be. He joined the therapy and sneaked into my home every time it was a frustrating day at the place. At least I could be sure I was not losing him. But Nick's dad was not done. Despite Nick following his rule, he did exactly what he promised he would not. Just five days after Nick started his therapy, his dad spread the news around their city about me being gay. My parents knew about me being gay, so it was not surprising for them. Even so, when they discussed this thing with me, I answered them truthfully. I told them it was Jack's dad who had spread the word around without my permission. Although what Nick's dad did wasn't a crime by any means, my parents argued with him. He did little to justify his position, and my parents had a fallout with him. On the other hand, it was surprising for others. Because my parents had a good image in the city, no one outright bullied me. But you could feel the change in their behavior now. Not in all of them, but in some of them. I decided not to tell Nick about it, thinking he had enough tension on his head. And I didn't want to add to it. For a while, it seemed like he didn't have any knowledge of it either. Then, on a rare outing with each other on the beach, some days after that entire fiasco, someone intentionally hit me with a soccer ball. Although Nick got into a scuffle with him, I got scared out of my wits. It was the first time someone had reacted like that to me, and it didn't help at all that I recognized the bully's face. We went to the supermarket to buy medical supplies to treat his bruises. As I cleaned his wounds, he looked at me strangely. He knew I was hiding something. I was putting a band-aid on his finger when Nick asked, What was he talking about? Does he know about us? I shook my head. I have not told anyone about us except my parents. Then how does he? He stopped in the middle and asked me if it was his dad. I couldn't lie to him, so I nodded. He took a deep breath, and his face was an angry shade of red. He lied to me. He said, I cannot believe I even trusted him. He stood up and told me he was going to talk to him. I grabbed his hand and told him that I needed to tend to him first before taking any steps. When I cleaned the little scratch off the corner of his mouth, he took my hand in his own and kissed the back of it. Then he promised he would not let his dad get in the way with everything he had done. I trusted him on that, honestly. The same day at somewhere around 9 at the night, Nick and his dad argued and I stood outside his home to make sure they did not get violent. Nick accused his dad of cheating on him, and his dad gave an unapologetic answer. He knew he did not care what Nick said. His mind was somewhere else entirely. Then he walked out of his home and told his dad he wouldn't return for the night. His dad swore behind him, but he took my hand and he walked out of there. We talked to my parents and they agreed to let Nick stay the night with us. We ate and decided to go to bed early because we already looked depressed enough. My parents didn't say anything to either of us. We talked little after that, mostly to discuss how we were going to handle Nick's dad. We were also a little worried about Jack and wanted to teach him a lesson. Nick eventually decided to talk about the therapy thing with an adult, most likely my parents. We knew it was a crime and that there was enough chance Nick's dad would get in trouble for that, but I didn't know if that can happen. I didn't know either, but I think we can think about it later, he answered. He turned to me, pressed some kisses on my cheeks, and said he missed me. To be honest, because of all this drama, we hadn't had a peaceful day for a long time. It made sense why he wanted to touch me. I kissed him in return, and we slept together after a long time. 
The next afternoon, Nick went to his home with the intent of talking to his dad about his erratic behavior. He had also planned to inform them that if he didn't stop going overboard with whatever he was trying to do, Nick would report him to the police for distress and coercion. It was our mutual plan, and we thought it would work. But when he returned, after seven minutes, he looked both disgusted and scared. I asked him what happened, and he told me, My dad is talking to a woman. What are they talking about? He is asking her to sleep with me, he answered, and I looked at him in shock. He's saying that this may be the last resort of turning me straight. That doesn't even make sense. You being gay is not a choice. It's natural. I think we should inform the police right away, I suggested. He went silent for a minute and then looked at me and said, We should do that, but to make sure that they're caught in the act, let us wait until the evening. I do not understand what you're trying to say. You will bring the police right when it starts, he said. I want to record it so that we have a solid proof of their crime. I'm not so sure we even need to do that, Nick. I was scared for him, and I didn't want him to go through so much distress only to catch his dad in the middle of his crime. I hated his dad and brother. It's just a couple more hours, and then it'll be all right. He pressed a long kiss to my mouth, and then he asked me to do as he planned. Although I wasn't sure how good or bad the idea was, I agreed to do as he said. The same evening, I roamed around the police station. At his first signal, I immediately informed the cops about the situation. You'd be surprised to know how seriously they take such matters. Within five minutes, we were at Nick's place. When I pointed the finger at the home, they rang the bell to check on the situation. Unfortunately for Nick's dad, that wasn't enough time. The woman and he were caught in the act and immediately arrested. I kissed Nick on caring of the police's presence. No more, Raymond, I promised him. Yeah, no more, Raymond. Then, we thought about Nick's older brother, Jack. When Jack returned late at night, he found us in the living room, kissing and watching some cheesy gay romance sitcom. He cringed and asked where his dad was. Nick told him the truth. He looked spooked, then Nick warned him that he was going to do something similar to him as well, for taking intimate pictures of two minors without their consent. Either with consent or not, it was a crime anyway. He looked a little disturbed and went into his bedroom, grabbed some stuff and went outside the home. Neither Nick or I have heard anything from him since that night. Just five days later, after Nick's dad was taken in by the police, life drastically changed for us. Nick's dad, Raymond, wouldn't be coming out of jail for a while, nor would that woman he had brought with him. It meant that Nick and I would have the entire home to ourselves, under the guidance and security of my parents, obviously. Although my parents were a little upset with me that I hadn't told them about the situation sooner, they agreed to be more understanding in the future. We kissed and we slept together, and no one had any complaints to make except for the occasional warnings that we received from my parents. When, with my dad's help, Nick filed a lawsuit against his dad for distress and abuse. Nick's dad was asked to pay him a small amount of fine. It was very little, but enough in a way. His dad had already left a ton of cash at home, so we decided to take advantage of it all. We played games, ordered takeouts, visited paid sites around the city and outside the city, and much more. Even then, enough cash was left. We even bought a Polaroid camera and clicked lots of pictures. I bought her Polaroid album to keep all those pictures safe. The thing he most liked about being out of the city was how much more open people were to us being boyfriends. It sparked something in Nick as well and said, maybe when we grow older we can leave that stupid city and live somewhere more understanding. Grow older as in gray and wrinkly? I was teasing him, and he laughed at that. We will live by the beachside when we grow that old, he answered. It sounds nice, I replied. Right? Right. He gave me his best sunshine smile, and suddenly I was glad I had been bold enough to kiss him at that party. If it hadn't been for that. Conclusion After that, it was easier to focus on our relationship and our studies. We decided to look for either the same college or at least one near each other. During those days of fun, where we spent Raymond's money whenever we wanted, we got to know about Nick's dad's future. He would be giving a three-year prison sentence for coercion and abuse. The woman he brought with him was given a two-year prison sentence. Nick tried to find Jack, but to no avail. We waited for a few weeks, but Jack never contacted us, probably out of fear. So we stopped hoping for his return as well. In the meantime, Nick and I decided staying in the city was no longer worth it. We planned that we would live the city once we turned 19. Obviously through the support of my parents. My parents, for that matter, were just as understanding as they were initially, although they were still just as protective. 
The city is the same as ever, except some of the residents left their hatred back. Tolerable, and yet not so much. We would leave the city, at least that was guaranteed. The end. Do you think parents have the right to take extreme measures just to make sure their kids remain as straight as a scale? Let us know in the comments down below. Thanks for watching. Consider subscribing to become part of our Rainbow Fort.